family. Mark and Krista, thank you for directing our hearts in worship and leading us to remember what really matters. Jesus Christ is worthy. What else matters? I'm grateful to be gathered intentionally with like-minded folks in the name of Christ. It's a little bit of effort sometimes to come to worship, isn't it? Oh, it's so early in the morning. I hear that often. I guess that's true. Would they come if it was later? I don't know. I, I see a mixed response. I get answers both ways. But I'm here with you with all of my heart. I love that Sunday happens to be the first day on the calendar of the week. We are here in the morning. We're here to give the first part of our week. Maybe for some of you, the very first waking hours, I don't know. Some of us have been up for hours and hours and hours up to this point. I know that some of you have too. This isn't good as a gathered people to make this our first activity together. We're just here to lavish at Jesus' feet our appreciation, honor, love, devotion, beautiful music, attention, care for one another. I always enjoy the reunions that happen here. I love seeing folks giving hugs and smiles and catching up on what's going on. Some of you commiserating with the poor Redfords who are getting ready to move. Some nervous giggles. We put out a plea for help this week. <laughs> In the first 24 hours, dear Luana replied, I'll be there with my Honda. I love you, Luana. I am looking forward to seeing you there with that Honda. And I don't know how we're going to get that piano in it. But we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Th Actually, since then, I have had a commercial vehicle offered with a lift. That is awesome. It'll still be fun to try to get the piano and the Honda, but we'll see how this all goes. In the midst of busyness, my life has really, there's Lou right there. In the midst of our busyness, isn't it good just to put everything down and to stop? And to remember what theme Krista has found in her music, that Jesus is worthy. As you pack up 21 years worth of memories and things and stuff, it really gives you perspective about what's going to last and what isn't going to last. I was privileged yesterday to lead a wedding. And it was a wedding for one of our dear baseball friends. Their son found a wonderful gal. And what a joy to be part of this service. And probably a dozen or so of Kyle's teammates, I'm talking from age 6 to age 18, were there. And so we spent a lot of time with these people, yelling at umpires and traveling and uh, celebrating victories and mourning losses. <laughs> you just really share life when you do that. It's like a, a different family that you have. Those kids all got together and had a picture together. And it really made me think about what matters in our lives. It really made me think about what lasts. I can, I can still picture those kids with little boy faces and um, uniforms that were too big. <laughs> I'm so thankful, and I told my son this yesterday. I'm so thankful that he has put Jesus first in his marriage and in his life. And both of us grieved a little bit for some of his friends that are not doing that. And so I can't help it. Through this whole week, I've just had so many reminders of what really matters for us. Today, I invite you to turn to Psalm 1. It's a beautiful picture of a life centered around what matters most. 
Yesterday I heard the father of the bride offer a speech. And in his speech, he started it off this way, which I so appreciated. Tyler and Caitlin, always put God at the very center of your lives. What's interesting is I did another wedding three weeks ago, and the father of the bride said almost the same thing as the first remarks out of his mouth. Always put God at the center of your lives and, of course, your marriage. I think that's amazing advice. I think that's important advice. I, I think that's incredible advice. And today's focus, a focus on Scripture, I think helps us to see what does that look like practically. We've been looking at core values, and I've been listing them off. And the longer I sit with these and really slow down with these core values, the more they're growing on me is extremely important. It really all starts with loving God. That's what putting God at the center of your life really looks like, doesn't it? Loving God with all of who we are as a church, with all of who we are as individuals. That overflows into loving people, doesn't it? In fact, if we don't love others that we can see, we probably don't love God who we can't see. And so the first and greatest command and the other Jesus added is just like it. Love God and love people. And that's going to amount to change. God's in a process of changing every one of us. He's changing our church. He's changing us. And for that, I'm so grateful. I'm glad I'm not that young kid who got upset at umpires. It's not me anymore. I wonder what it's, how it's going to be different to see grandchildren on the other side of that fence. You know, little kids, baseball is wonderful except for the parents. And I was one of them, I think, from time to time. God's changing us. He's transforming us. We celebrate God's presence as a church 24-7. It isn't just about focusing on Jesus here. It's about focusing on him all the time and training our hearts and minds and eyes to recognize the presence of Jesus with us. All throughout life. This morning I want to focus on scripture. And so I'll talk about the importance for us of doing that. And Psalm 1 helps us to have a visual of the importance of centering our lives around scripture. Next week we will talk about community. The importance of sharing our lives together. And we'll finish up with the importance of sharing our lives outside of that community. And outreach. If you think about it. Seven simple descriptions I think they show us and they, they, they give meaning to what it means to put God at the very center of our lives. I want to do that practically with you as a church. I want to be centered on the right things. I want them to lead us forward as a congregation. So Psalm 1, here's uh, our extended core value on Scripture. The Bible is authoritative. It's unfailing. Do you believe that that's true? We submit to the truth of Scripture. These aren't new core values, by the way. Our church has been practicing this for almost 60 years as uh, Meridian Friends, the Friends Church at large for the better part of 400 years. They're not new, but it's good to articulate that that's what, that's, that's what we want to guide us forward. That we submit to the truth of Scripture. We place a high priority on equipping all to read, understand, and apply the Bible to life. Would you stand with me as you're able? And I want to read from Psalm chapter 1, a beautiful introduction to the book of Psalms. It talks about blessing, and I want you to notice the promise that's offered here. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked 
will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. And may God help us to be planted by his streams of water. Amen? Please be seated. Psalm 1, I'm sure you noticed, begins with the word blessed. It's a description of what life can look like. It can look like a blessed life. So the first couple of verses help us see that tree that's flourishing and has deep roots that are nourishing this plant. But then in the next couple of verses, we see what it looks like not to be in the place of blessing. There are two kinds of promises in Scripture. There are unconditional promises and there are conditional promises. And Psalm 1 is a description then of a conditional promise. It's an if-when. If we do this or when we do this, then we receive something out of it. So many people admire the Bible. They would never speak against it. They might be somewhat superstitious about it in terms of treating it with respect and gentle care as a book, as something that's in front of them. They might revere it in that way. They might even say that they believe it, but they don't drink from it constantly. They're not rooted in a sense of letting it change their life. They don't spend the time to get familiar with what is in the Scripture. And this is a conditional promise. It's conditioned upon our root system, if you will. So I want to talk about these wins, these if wins. If we'll do this, when we do this, then. I want us to see that because I think that that is so important for us to get a grasp of here. So I'm going to give three conditions for the blessing that's available to us in Psalm 1. The first one is this. We are blessed when we welcome the authority of God's Word. When we welcome it. You know, the truth is, God gives us a choice as to what we welcome and what we reject. Or what we welcome and what we ignore. Am I right? We're not forced, actually, to believe anything. You can believe whatever you want to believe. Romans talks about that, by the way. Instead of believing what they knew that was the truth about God, they deliberately chose to believe lies. Is that an accurate description? We're given free will. We're given free choice to accept or to ignore, to focus on, or to reject. That, that's our choice. If you want to believe in Bigfoot because you saw that on YouTube, you're free to believe that. If you want to believe that there is no right or wrong in this world, if you want to believe that there's no afterlife, if you want to believe the moon's made out of cheese or the earth is flat, you can believe that. <laughs> you get to choose what it is you believe. As a church family, historically as a friend's movement, certainly uh, our church family, some six, almost 60 years old this February, we turned 60 years old, we believe that the Scripture is the authority to which we all must agree. There are truths outside of the Scripture. The unity you prefer is, is a Macintosh better than a PC. You won't find that in the Bible. And you might have some differences in our church about those kind of things, other truths that are out there. The Bible doesn't answer all of those things, but it says that it's capable, its purpose is to make us wise unto salvation and to give us reproof and correction and training and righteousness to prepare us for good works that God has in advance for us to do. So the Bible has a very specific purpose to draw us to Jesus and to change our lives. And for that, it is absolutely infallible. It's accurate. It never fails, right? That's what we believe. It's voluntary as to whether people choose to accept that. I'm here to say we voluntarily accept that. We believe that what God says in the Bible is true 
and we welcome God's authority over us. I read this story about a captain of a ship who looked into the dark night and saw a light in the distance. Immediately, he told his signalman to send a message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. Send that. Well, promptly, the ship received a reply. Alter your course 10 degrees north. The furious captain sent another message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a captain. Soon another reply was received. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I'm Seaman Third Class Jones. The captain sent a final message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a battleship. The reply was, alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a lighthouse. (laughs) We get to choose the source of our authority, but we don't get to choose the aftermath of what happens. The truth of God will not move. It will not change. And it's up to us to decide if we trust what God has said enough to alter our course rather than to take what we find as the light of the Scripture and somehow demand upon it that it must change to fit what I think. And that's a posture of humility. That's a posture of acceptance. That's a posture of welcoming, of having fertile soil in our heart, not not soil that's distracted or trampled upon, not, not the seed that's, that's fallen in thorns, infested with sin. It's the heart that is receptive to the planting of God's seed and letting that take over, not the other way around. In some ways, it's not so much that we read the Bible, but the Bible reads us. We're the ones under the authority, and that's unique to anything else we might read. We want to evaluate it. We want to decide if it's true. We're critical as we come to anything else that we take in. But with Scripture, the one who's blessed is the one who welcomes the authority of God, who grows deep roots to accept and to find life in what God says. And the rest of the Psalms play that out, don't they? They talk to us about God's Word being precious and sweeter than honey and a, and a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It talks about how we rely on the very words that God says to bring us our life and our direction. We welcome the authority of God's Word. There's a second condition that I see in Psalm, in Psalm 1. We're blessed when we work on growing our familiarity with God's Word. I do want to say it, it's one thing to hold the Bible in really high esteem and to say this is the authority. It's another thing to really invest in getting to know what's actually there. And, and I want to tell you, it takes a lot of work. So many people want to stay in the shallow end of the pool when it comes to the Bible. They're frankly intimidated by it. They start to read it. They're confused. If they're concrete, sequential thinkers like myself, they want to start at the beginning and go through it. And if you've done that, you're amazing if you made it all the way through, all by yourself. It's written over so many different generations it, in centuries, it's written by so many different authors in so many different contexts. So many people don't even know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it becomes frustrating. And I want to tell you, if that's your experience, that's a bad case of normal. Anyone who's ever been serious about studying the Bible comes to a place of wow, I have a lot of work to do. I mean, everybody. I remember when 
I received Christ as a teenager, and I was so excited to grow. And, and I heard everybody say, you got to get in the Bible. you got to get in the Bible. I had a job at a restaurant the summer between my junior and senior year, and I got on the graveyard shift. And not a lot was happening in the graveyard shift after about 2.30 in the morning. And so I'd have a lull. I remember bringing my Sony Walkman. And I purchased a whole set of cassette tapes from a preacher in Medford. They had a really big church. And I'd take out my Michael Jackson tapes, and I'd put in Pastor Corson. And I'd listen with my headphones at the employee table because nobody else was in there. And of all things, the book that I chose to study, there were like seven tapes, was the book of Ezekiel. <laughs> There's a lot of lessons in this. You, 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 shouldn't, you shouldn't try to do this on your own, okay? <laughs> you really should do this in community. You should do this with people who have maybe a few steps ahead of you. But oh, man, I remember my mind was blown. I had a spiral notebook. I almost filled it. I was so hungry to learn what was there. I didn't know you weren't supposed to start on Ezekiel. <laughs> but I found it fascinating. And I remember verses, uh, chapters 35 to 38, and Gog against Agog. And who was Gog? And who was Agog? And, of course, you know... And, and the Battle of Armageddon, and I thought, I want to see that. I want to see Armageddon. I want to go to Israel. I want to see that. And I want to know what these wheels are inside of the wheels. And, and the Valley of Dry Bones and this army that God's going to resurrect. But they're images, and they're things that I've held precious in my heart because I was so hungry to learn. I needed to find a church family. I needed to find people who could guide me and could help me the way a, a mom or dad or grandparent would walk their child through at an early age, step by step by step. But I was hungry. And I don't understand how some people just give up. And, and they're content to just stay in the shallow end of the pool. My encouragement to you is dive in the deep end. Dive in the deep end where you have the safety of others around you, okay? That's one thing. You're here in context. Don't be afraid to walk into a Sunday school class that's over your head. Why not? There are others there who love you, who care about you. Don't be afraid to dive in. What are you afraid of? Well, it's my pride. I don't want to look silly. You're not going to learn to swim if you don't. Let me ask you this, is it more dangerous to dive into the deep end of the pool or to dive into the shallow end of the pool? <laughs> Don't stay in the shallow end of the pool. Your life will be blessed if you develop the root system in your life. I became a youth pastor only three years into my Christian experience. And I have to tell you, teachers learn more than anybody. Some of the keys of Bible study are to do it together. Don't be afraid. Everybody who cares about you will be delighted that you're asking great questions. They'll be delighted. Talk about what you're learning. Don't try to do it by yourself. Put it into words. Explain to your small group. Get into those contexts where you're going to learn, whether it's a women's study or a men's study or Bible study fellowship or... Sunday school or wherever, it's there. I didn't have the internet then. Imagine. <laughs> we can consume what we choose to consume. I want to ask us, Meridian friends, are we growing? If you think about a tree, a lot of a tree is below ground. And I, I read some conflicting information based on species, of course, on the types of trees. But as much as 50% of this living organism is invisible because it's underground. And it's such a great description of our feeding on the Bible. It, it isn't something that other people necessarily need to even know about. It's you spending time with God's Word, reading and listening and investing. And your non-Christian friends, it they may not be that interested in it, but they'll see it in the life that's above ground. 
not so with those who don't welcome or work on God's word. Not so. They're, it says they're like chaff. It says that the wind blows and they fall. You know, some of you are aware of some challenges that a couple of our massive trees are having on this campus. Are you familiar? You've pulled up a couple of Sundays in the last few months and you've seen tremendous limbs blown down in the wind. Well, we got an arborist up there. They cut out several of those limbs. And sure enough, what they're finding is it's dead inside. I don't know much about trees, but they said that this is a level nine alert to get those trees out. So unfortunately, the whole trees have to go. They left some samples. Did you wonder what this was? You know, usually they put bright, colorful flowers on an altar table to brighten your Sunday to help you feel alive and refreshed and thinking about God's beauty. But not me. I brought you rotting branches. <laughs> of course, what's important about these is you can see in the center, there's decay. There were some limbs they took off that were this big that were almost completely hollow on the inside. And those are the ones that come the windstorm, they fall down. A little bit dangerous for us. It's right over where the bicyclists go by and cars park and people walk and everything else. So those trees will be eliminated at the right time. We have to get a permit with the city of Meridian. They're old growth trees by the road. They won't have any problem with it, but it's going to happen. But I bring them here to show you how beautiful they actually look on the outside compared to what's really going on on the inside. What's on the inside brings life. We can look good maybe for a really long time. Those trees have been out here as long as I have, 30 years I've been seeing them. I know that they're much older than that because they were that size <laughs> when I got here. So some of you will know maybe a little better than I do how long those have been around. But at some point they stop thriving. And I think we're like that in our Christian life at some point. We just stop working on it. We get to a place where Hey, you know, I've done my time. <laughs> What's next? When the wind comes, we're going to find out. When the storms of false teaching or adversity or temptation or whatever it is assault the strength of our spiritual lives, they're going to tumble. Are you working on your spiritual life? Are you working on understanding God's word? Nobody else can do that for you. I, I have to say, I am thoroughly enjoying the Sunday school class we're going through right now. It's so challenging. We have another Sunday school class coming up in a few weeks. It's about to start. It's called the Silent Years. It's on the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It gives a beautiful perspective on the New Testament. I mean, we can offer it. <laughs> Are we growing as a church family? Are we putting enough emphasis on this? Whatever other plans we make strategically as a church, are we making provision for the deepening of those roots? Every time our small groups get together, every time our youth get together, are we spending time deepening those roots? Is it our priority? Here's a third condition, of course. When we walk according to what we hear. It is one thing to welcome the authority of Scripture. It's one thing to keep working on it. But what happens when you find out there's something in there that's going to cause you to make a change in life you simply do not want to make? What if you don't want to listen? Sometimes it's not a problem with what we don't know. It's a problem with what we do know. 
Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but the one who absolutely delights in God's ways. I want to lead us into a time of open worship, and I'm going to do that by reading from Matthew chapter 7. Jesus gives us the familiar comparison of a life that's built on the right things and a life that's built on the wrong things, a life that's built on what doesn't move and a life that's built on what does move. The life that's built on the rock versus the life that's built on the sand. But there's a detail about this that I think we sometimes miss because we're too familiar with the story. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 26 says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. What's the difference between the rock and the sand? Is it that they heard the word of God? No, that's not the difference. They both heard the word of God. The difference is the and. They heard the word of God and they put it into practice. Or they heard the word of God and they did not put it into practice. This is really convicting. We can know the scripture inside and out. We can hold it in high esteem. We can reverence it. But if we are not applying it, when the wind comes, when the storm waters rise, it will come crashing. As we take a moment just for some silent prayer and listening, hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Would you join me in a moment of silence, listening and prayer, inviting the Holy Spirit to speak to you and your condition?